Okay, good morning and uh, welcome back. So we'll get the session started. And the first talk of the session will be by Jacques Pro. And he'll be talking about uh, active fluctuations and microphase separation in cells, in the intercell nucleus. Jacques is from Institute Curie and he's also at uh, the Mechanobiology Institute in Singapore. Okay, so do you hear me? That's okay. All right, so, uh, oops, uh, okay, yeah. Okay, maybe you recognize the, the guy here. <laughs> and he, he looks a bit tense, so he's just like me now. <laughs> but it turns out, so that was just before his, his lecture, this first lecture. <laughs> and uh, okay, we are all like that, I should say. But I prefer this, this picture. And that's a wonderful weekend that we had a few months ago, or not, a month and a half or whatever, yes? Well, it's great, a great time. And uh, so, you know when you age, you get a bit senile, and I misread the program, and I prepared for an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I, had, I had to make choices and to cut down. <clears throat> And so eventually I cut down for the first two just out of laziness, basically. But there was there's another reason that you will discover for that piece. So the first piece will be uh, just uh, uh, it's a you know it's a challenge that was given by by Shiva. Uh, you know I, I see lots of fluctuation in embryonic stem cell. Here are the data. What can you say? And as, you see, as you'll see, I cannot say much, but still I can say a few things. Uh, and then, the, uh, and actually that was earlier, and uh, it's a collaboration with Madan, who is right here, uh, with Amit, who is now on, on postdoc in uh, Dresden, and uh, uh, Jean-Francois, who is a, a PI uh, in Marseille. And again, it was uh, challenged by uh, uh, Shiva, and I'll tell you more in detail what this challenge was. And I don't think I will have time to speak of the third piece, uh, which uh, again is a, it's, it's a family, because uh, uh, Tetsuya, I think, graduated with uh, um, Masao, and, uh, um, and Rakesh, is a grandson of Shuram. I don't, I don't know if Shuram knows him, but he's a grandson of Shuram. Because he, oh, he's he a big student. what? No, he's Shraddha student. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> he graduated with Shraddha, so same family. <laughs> uh, anyway, and, and so that piece, uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, but uh, the the idea was, you know, this 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 idea is in the nucleus to discuss phase separation being. Euchromatin and heterochromatin by introducing uh, uh, different temperatures. It's a nice idea, but somehow we wanted to do something else and, and introduce in some way machines. And, and there we have uh, uh, we've introduced a machine which we, well, we hope it looks like uh, topoisomerase 2, actually. Which, uh, so, but uh, I, I don't know if I will have time to speak about that, but you do get microphase separation, and it's, uh, it looks quite promising, in fact. So let's, let's start with the first challenge of uh, Shiva. Oh, I'll say I don't have to come back here. Can I not? OK. And, and so the challenge is the following. You look at the uh, uh, you know, embryonic stem cell under the microscope, and you see this over this on one hour time scale, you see this huge shape change. And here is your five microns, so the size, the average size of this of the nucleus is about 10 microns, but you see that there, there are very strong fluctuations. And uh, uh, and so Shiva, you know, are you able to say something? And uh, so with Sedige uh, and Farshid, uh, we studied the, the shape, this shape fluctuation there. And ah, I always, okay. And the first thing that you can do is define an average shape, define the departure from that average shape for, in a given angle, and, and you look at the, uh, uh, 
equal time mean square fluctuation. And, and you see that's one thing that we've seen there is if you go at 90 degrees from, say, your reference direction, it's totally uncorrelated. So these, these are three different nuclei, and there's a fourth one. This fourth one never did like the others. So we suspect that this cell was already on its way to uh, differentiations. So, but if we just look at these three there, they, they are not, so at 90 degrees, they are not correlated with uh, what's happening in the uh, reference direction. Uh, which means that uh, now if we think in terms of modes, if you have, say, the volume change, so zero mode, and let's say the uh, uh, oblate prolate mode, so the pneumatic mode to, to speak, they must be correlated in such a way that they kill everything at 90, you know, every correlation at 90 degrees. And so then uh, we got, we, we did expand the shape variation in, in, in 2D mode. So, so these are projections. This is not 3D, otherwise we would have to use uh, spherical harmonics, but these are projections. And so, uh, uh, so we look at this, this pose here. And here is the, the amplitude, the average amplitude of the modes. And see the zero mode is the most fluctuating. Then one is translation, but the way we do the analysis, it's suppressed. So it's normal that it's zero. Then mode two is also important. And then you see that the rest is basically negligible. And uh, for, the, for the fourth, the, the, fourth the, the maverick of the series, uh, it was just one, the zero mode, and the rest was basically negligible. Uh, OK, so can we say more? Oh, Jesus, you always come back. Uh, and so we, we decided to uh, uh, measure the, cor the so cor correlation function, say the zero mode with itself, zero mode with mode two, well, no, mode two with zero mode, zero mode with mode two, and mode two with mode two. And so, uh, and you see that you can change you know, T into T prime equals T plus tau and get this correlation here. And because, uh, you know, but steady state is uh, as a time transitional invariant symmetry, then this uh, uh, tells you that R0, 0 of minus tau is R0 of tau. So that for the diagonal component, this is just, it doesn't matter. It's always satisfied, should always be satisfied. Same for R2, 2. Now the interesting piece is for the cross correlation. The cross, you can do the same job there, but you see now that, and if I use the fact that product is co commutes, I can, I get here W0 of T prime, W2 of T prime minus two. So this is R02 of minus two. So by construction, you know, the, the correlation from two to zero for positive time is equal to the correlation from zero to two to negative time, right? But, and, and of course, if, if it's in a thermal system, uh, you have, T minus the symmetry, so it means that then the cross correlation two zero is equal to the cross correlation zero two. But even if the system is not in equilibrium, if the noise is not in equilibrium, then these two guys should be different. And so that's a test, a simple test of whether or not these fluctuations are uh, uh, in equilibrium or not. And on top of that, uh, this guy, if there, is, if there was no pneumatic order in the nucleus, there, you, there would be no way you could correlate this guy. So the fact that you find non-zero values for these guys tell you that there must be some kind of pneumatic order in the nucleus. So what does the experiment tell us? Well, here, here they are. So R0, 0, see so this is this blue guy here, and you see it's it's perfectly symmetrical, really amazing. Same for R22, as you would expect. 
and you, the shape is non-trivial, but all details are reproduced. So that's very nice. But now if you look, if you compare R0 to an R2 zero, so now R0 to is this red guy here, and it's very different from R2 zero. And, and they are, of course, anti-symmetric, as, as that, that by construction. And so uh, uh, clearly, we learned two things. This is, and this is the only thing I'm able to say. Fluctuation are out of equilibrium, and there is some hidden pneumatic order. What? No, if I, if, I, if I go to the same time, now if it was equilibrium, it would be equal. And uh, if they are unequal, that tells me it's out of equilibrium. If I put a minus here, then I will get equality, exactly equality. And I can check that on the data. All right? OK, so, and I'm not able to say anything more. Now, uh, oh well, I can, not quite true. We can uh, uh, write down uh, Langevin equations for these two modes. We introduce the coupling here, we feed the data, and we find that uh, the, so B and C are different, so on Sager relation are not satisfied, but it's just a, another way of saying the same thing. There's nothing new there, except that if you, if you come back to that, you see that there is some kind of uh, uh, damped oscillation there, and you can reproduce that. Okay, but it's not a big deal. We don't know. We don't learn mo more. Uh, now let's get to how oh, she's the other part. Uh, and here, so Shiva was playing with a uh, hectare actually, putting fibroblasts. So now fully differentiated cells on uh, uh, patterns. And on the right here, it's on a, on a disc and circular, with circular symmetry. And, uh, and on the left, it's a rectangle. And, uh, but it's the same cell. And uh, uh, you see, so one thing I want you to remember is that the nucleus here is on the side, whereas here it's right in the middle. But uh, what they did is they looked at fluctuation on an hour time scale or yeah, something like that. Uh, or here, actually, in this, the, I couldn't find it, how to show you the videos, but, uh, and, and they look at the area fluctuation here, projected area fluctuations. And, and, and here, the, the, you know, three cases, but I, I don't think I have time to show you the videos. But the, the, here is the puzzle, is that you start so these cells which are on a disk, they fluctuate a lot, like 9% area fluctuation. These on the, on the rectangle here, it's about half or you know, about four and something percent. But now you put cytokinasin D, which is supposed to depolymerize actin. And if you depolymerize actin from a case where the, your cell is on a circular disk, then you decrease the fluctuation level. You basically, you divide it by two. Now, if you put the same amount of cytokinasin D on a cell which is on a rectangle, you see that you crank up the fluctuation by almost a factor of two, exactly opposite effect, which is something, you know, you don't like so much, and you have a biochemical cue, and you don't want it to have an opposite effect just by changing geometry. And if you do it somewhere in between, this is in between. And now if you put on, the, on, on a circular disk here, uh, uh, these giant fluctuations, you put just back quinoin, and so you crank up actually uh, uh, you know, polymerization of actin, the fluctuation level is badly suppressed. And so Shiva came up and said, can you say something about that? And to, to start with, my first reaction was say, well, I can't say nothing. Ah, uh, oh, just always. And then we looked at, so uh, 
is Madan, uh, Hamid, and Francois. We, we, we look at you know, drawings and also, and, and, and also at features, and you see that on a disk, you don't develop stress fibers. On the rectangle, you develop a very strong uh, array of stress fibers, and the cartoon would be like that. So here, the nucleus is, you know, is, is on one side compressed, but it's, it's strongly uh, uh, assigned to be in the middle of the, uh, uh, of the rectangle, whereas here, there's not much uh, uh, action there, and you see this in the side. So is there a simple way of taking that into account? And we first started to, uh, to play with a very, very naive uh, uh, toy problem. We put a, a rigid uh, uh, inclusion here between two segments of active gel. And, and we started with not putting this prefactor here. Uh, not putting uh, this uh, you know, thermal noise here, and just assuming active noise, SRAM contractile term, and viscous term in, in one dimensional problem. And, and, uh, and also assuming, and, and if, you, if you do that, uh, actually you wind up with multiplicative noise, and I'll come back on that. Uh, pr pretty quickly, but, uh, and we were happy because we could show a number of things which I will talk about. But then Jean-Francois went uh, to a conference in Bangalore, and he had a poster, and Sriram went to the poster and said, well, maybe, maybe, looks, looks okay, but why did you choose Stratonovich convention, and you know, I'd be convinced only if you show that indeed it's Stratonovich. And it turns out, sometimes after, I don't know how, or before, I don't know exactly, but Frank also went to the poster and he said just the same thing. And so Jean Francois came back a, a bit you know, disappointed. And, and we discuss with Madan, with, <laughs> it's, uh, right, and we, we have to show, we have to do something. And to do, and, and uh, somehow looking at the literature, we realized that if you introduce time scales like uh, uh, inertia, for instance, then you can show which is a relevant uh, uh, convention, if, if any. And so we decided to introduce time scales, and one, one way is to have a Maxwell gel. So that's, what, that's why you have this prefactor here, and we transiently introduce also thermal noise, then which we assume to be delta correlated both in space and time. The uh, uh, active noise, at least at that level, we gave it a time scale. And, uh, and then it's easy to integrate I mean, the, the stress. You know, uh, 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 has to be constant along the length here. It's just momentum conservation. Because we didn't include, uh, uh, you know, uh, mass term in, in, the, in that equation, right? And so you can integrate that easily over, let's say, the left side, and you get an expression for the stress. And it depends only on time now. But you see that, so the important piece is that piece here, the noise, so you can integrate the noise, no problem, but it's divided by the, the uh, effective length of that guy. So that's what drives the multiplicative noise. And now you write down the dynamics of the inclusion, so the you know, stress on the left minus stress on the right, is uh, uh, has to be equal to the force, to so the rest restoring force, and we and we kept mass here, just to be able to find out which was the correct convention. And ah, I just I always, and so yeah, okay, you get an equation now for the for the uh, position of the inclusion, 
and see if I let the mass go to zero, I'm only left with what we started with uh, at the beginning and that three I didn't like so much. And, uh, uh, but, but still, it's, this is linear in velocity, so you can solve it, uh, you know. And then you can, you know, do a, a, a time, uh, uh, you know, use the fact that the Maxwell time is smaller than the fluctuation time itself, smaller than the response time of the system, and you can let the mass go to zero, you can do all of that. And you wind up, and I don't want to discuss so much this one, I will discuss the next one. You can, you can show, you can get the Foucault-Planck equation, and the Foucault-Planck equation looks pretty much, so if, you, so if we didn't have that term, it would be like a Stratonovich guy, but with a, with a noise which is non-trivial, uh, you know, square root of the square of the, you know, thermal and active noise, but the, uh, so, you know, the new thing is that you have these terms that you would not have if it was only Stratonovich. So in general, if both thermal and non-thermal are uh, comparable, it's neither of the standard uh, uh, conventions. There's no, but if we, so, but we are lazy and actually, Knowing, not knowing what I told you in the first in the in, in the first part because we didn't have done that yet, but uh, uh, knowing, for instance, uh, the the experiments by uh, uh, Christoph Schmidt, for instance, where you see that a long time the uh, active fluctuations are much larger than thermal. If you go to, to sh much shorter time, you, that would not be true, but but for a long time the active fluctuations are much larger. So if we neglect that, then we get simple Stratonovich, and you can solve it and this, uh, the probability distribution analytically. And you see that it has a very simple shape, but it depends very much on that parameter, which compares, let's say, the, uh, the restoring force and the noise in some you know, uh, dimensionless way. And so if these guys equal to one half, the probability is completely flat. If this guy is smaller than one half, the probability diverges at the edges. So there is a tendency for your inclusion to, to sit at the edges. And if the restoring force is large enough, uh, it goes to the center. And so, which is the probability he looks like that. Let's say for strong restoring force, you have this uh, orange curve here with the probability maximum in the middle. For weak restoring force, you see that this guy diverges there, where the integral is, is one, of course. But uh, if you look at this, you know, take a snapshot, you have great chances to see your inclusion on the side and not in the middle. And, uh, uh, but you can cancel, so since we have the analytic expression, we can calculate the, uh, uh, the variance of the, uh, the position here. And we, we are disappointed because it, it's, uh, it's monotonous. It goes like, you know, one over k to some power, yes. So, uh, uh, ha -ha. What, what is it? But then if you look at, so this is a simulation, and for, let's say, so for strong, so this, uh, this corresponds to that curve here, for strong uh, 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 restoring force, you see uh, that some level of fluctuation there. For weak restoring force, if I take, a, you know, if I take an average over a finite time, now I, I will find weak fluctuations. And so an intermediate will find large fluctuations. So if I take you know, an average over some finite time, this is, the picture is completely different. And then you have, you have a clear maximum, so depending on parameters that you can choose or not choose, and so on, you can, you, you, but most of the time you have this maximum here, and there's a clear case here in that, you know, where, where you get that maximum here. So somehow, and you could say, okay, so far so good, 
but is this just an inclusion? So it doesn't look much like uh, uh, your nuclear. So we did some more, and then the key calculation is a bit more messy. But uh, uh, so now we put an elastic uh, uh, in between two inclusions. Uh, our active gel like that, and another elastic element or spring uh, here, which maintains the, the whole guy at some height. And you can work out again the, uh, uh, the uh, now the fluctuation in, this, in the size of this uh, uh, elastic element. And depending on activity here, so if I go there, you see that there is a very, very clear maximum. And so somehow in a, in a very simple and naive way, we can answer Shiva's question. And I guess that's it. And I won't be able to take a, <laughs> speak of Rakesh, but that's another time. <laughs> I have a question by the time people come. Uh, so in this case, you, I mean, the, the, the fluctuations coming mostly from the actin skeleton. Yeah, which is yeah, yeah, but yeah. In, when you depolymerize actin with uh, cytocalasin D, and uh, have this looked at the fluctuations after that, and is there a component coming from Actually, the Actually, I, I took uh, uh, Shiva's word for granted. Uh, I think he can uh, uh, turn myosin off. And if you turn myosin off, the fluctuation level decreases significantly. So that so you don't it's, over, it's obviously an, uh, an, uh, an approximation, but, but it, it turns the, the fluctuation level very, very low, which is not the case for the embryonic stem cell. For the embryonic stem cells, there is no lamin A and C, and, and that's why it fluctuates a lot more. And as far as we can tell, there is no connection to the uh, cortex. And so the fluctuations in the case of the embryonic stem cell are probably or certainly not due to the actomyelin system. So I think it's, I mean, you, 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 your question is, I think is completely relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, I, I suspect we could, add, there must be some coming from the nucleus itself. But uh, uh, as far as I can tell, or, uh, there, there are there maybe 10% of the uh, total. Of the, yeah. Hi. Uh, so I have a question. Like These are cells which are at the equilibrium sitting on a surface where uh, you are changing the shape of the cell. Uh, but what if your cell is migrating? Sometimes the fluctuations are a little higher than this much, right? So in such cases, should I think that the, the dynamics of actin is causing an added fluctuation? Or yeah, I'm just trying to understand how should I? So I, I, I I'm trying to see if I understood your question. You're saying, so the, the cells are resting on a substrate. Right. And what if I don't have a substrate? Right. They just float. So I, then, this is a work we did with, with, with uh, Guillaume Salbreu and Jean-Francois years back. And, and it comes from observation. And, and, and actually, uh, I'm on, right? Yeah. Then you see, you see oscillations yes. of, of the whole cell. But if you have a nucleus there, it's called, you know, um, nucleus is also connected to this, uh, to the outer cell, and so I think. Did you see also uh, uh, oscillation of the uh, nucleus shape? Yeah, nucleus yeah, shape yeah. Also changes, but we didn't analyze the nucleus shape. Yeah, but but I, I, but with, uh, I would say with naked eyes we we could see that it was correlated. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a different problem, completely different problem. Okay, I'll talk. So in your model, you um, showed these distributions. You can either have a, 
uh, sort of a monomodal distribution at the center or a bimodal distribution at the boundaries. Can you measure such distributions and sort of show the switch from monomodal to bimodal? No, that we did not study. But I just remarked that if I look at the picture, uh, when it's on a disk, it's on one side, it's on the side, and what, but I don't know if that's a correct explanation. Because, you know, a cell is orders of magnitude more complex than just that simple argument. But, okay. 